Well, welcome everyone to Alpha Kappa Psi's Brotherhood Unbounded virtual keynote series. We're very excited to have you all with us tonight. As you might know, Brotherhood Unbounded is the Alpha Kappa Psi exclusive program designed to help members stay connected to their brothers and their chapter and to help brothers learn how to cope with personal stress and also to help brothers develop skills beneficial in their career development. Tonight's focus is on personal development and it's taking a look at getting to know your Berkman results. And my name is Jason Pierce and I have the honor of serving Alpha Kappa Psi as the Director of Education and I will be your webcast producer tonight. Before we dive into the content, I wanna go over just a few housekeeping uh, details. So all participants have been muted uh, for the presentation and uh, begin with the video off. Um, while we will keep participants muted throughout the content portion of the program, please feel free to turn on your video. We recommend doing so other participants and the presenter can see you. So thank you everyone for doing that. The chat feature is also available for you to interact with other attendees and the presenter during the presentation. And when posting, it will share your name as it's listed in Zoom. So we recommend changing your name by clicking the three dots to also include your university if you would. At certain points during the presentation and at the end during the Q&A, you can also submit questions via the chat feature, or if you would like to verbally ask your question, click the raise hand icon uh, button on your screen and you will be unmuted when it's your turn to ask the question. And we'll go over this again at the end. So for tonight's presentation, our speaker, Chris Woods with Plaid LLC has put together a presentation for you, which will then be followed by the live Q&A. Again, if you have that question, please put it into the chat feature. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our speaker tonight, Chris Woods. Chris? Great, thank you so much, Jason. What an honor it is to be with you all this evening. I wanna thank Jason and the entire Alpha Kappa Psi team for allowing me to be with you this evening. We're gonna be talking about a fun topic and maybe the most interesting topic there is. You, we're gonna be talking about you this evening. How fun. Throughout the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna be going through a presentation related to the Berkman Method Assessment that you hopefully have taken up until this point. We'll be walking through a, a basic understanding of what the results are saying about your personality and what they might be saying about other people's personalities as well. As Jason mentioned, uh, I work for a company called Plaid. We are an organizational training and development firm. And, and I really do think I have a pretty cool job. I get to help people understand more about themselves so that they can function better and make better decisions for themselves and for the others around them and the people that they care about. And so tonight's session is really going to focus on these objectives. First, we're going to be talking about examining your behavioral tendencies. We're also going to be talking about analyzing and going through some of your motivators. And last, we'll be focusing on some of your personality strengths and challenges uh, that we all have. And so this is meant to be fun and light, but hopefully very insightful and revealing into different aspects of your personality and how you function within this wonderful world that we live in. If you have them available, I recommend pulling up your Berkman Method results. That will allow you to follow along as we go through the presentation. If you if you are on our learning management system uh, and you have access to it, look at the Berkman uh, basics report, and that will help you, or the Berkman map report, and that will allow you to kind of follow along as we go. No worries if you don't have it on hand, you'll still get a lot out of this, and you can revert back to your assessment results at a later time, um, but it would certainly help as we go through. So first and foremost, let's talk about a, a philosophy concept that's been around for thousands of years, and that is the concept of knowing thyself. Knowing thyself, the, the unexamined life is not worth living. Concepts that have been around for thousands of years and are widely accepted in today's society as key factors to uh, having success in your relationships, in your career, and in the other aspects of, of your life. Um, but why is that important? Why is knowing thyself so important? Well, Part of it is we recognize that there are three relationships that we have in our lives. First, we have this relationship with self. 
that little voice inside of our head that's always talking, that's always telling us what to do. Some of us call it a conscience, but really it's the relationship that we have with ourselves and the decisions that we make. But we also have a relationship with other people, our friends, our family, our coworkers, our peers, all the different people that we interact with on a daily basis. And lastly, we have a relationship with the stuff that we do, the organizations that we're a part of, our school, our fraternity, our religious institutions, whatever it might be. But the common denominator is relationship with self. When our relationship with self is, I'll say off, is not in sync with our relationship with others or our relationship with the other things that we do, well, that's when we experience conflict. And maybe you've experienced that before, where the way you saw the world or your relationship with yourself and how you perceived your behavior was actually not in sync with the way other people perceived that same behavior or the way an organization that you were operating within its expectations of how you were supposed to behave. And, and that happens to all of us. But that's why it's really important to know who self is, is so that we can have better relationships with others and, and with the stuff that we do. Now, there are a lot of great ways that we can gain self-awareness. We can meditate, we can exercise, we can do 360 evaluations where we ask other people that know and care about us what, what we do well and what we could do better. Uh, and another way to gain self-awareness is through a personality assessment, some sort of inventory where you answer a series of questions and based on all sorts of data, they will provide you with some humanistic styles that relate to your responses to those questions. And there's lots of great assessment tools out there, but we really like one called the Berkman Method. And, and we utilize this tool in pretty much all of the education that we provide with our clients because it tends to be the most comprehensive and thorough um, assessment tool that we can find. And again, no judgment. There's lots of great assessment tools. They all offer some level of insight into who we are, but the Berkman goes deep. And it comes from a, a, a man actually named Dr. Roger Berkman, who developed this assessment tool over 65 years ago. So it's been around for a long time and it's had a lot of validation. But it's interesting, he created this assessment tool out of an experience that he had as a young man. And, and that story goes something like this. He was a fighter pilot uh, in World War II and his objective was to fly planes, drop off supplies, drop off you know, carriers, things like that. And on his last mission, his plane was shot down. And hearing him tell this story uh, was pretty intense. For the first time I heard it, I was like, wow, this guy has really had a, a life or death situation where he describes being in the cockpit, flying the plane, and everything's fine. Normal day, they had their orders, everything was good, and then the plane was hit. And all of a sudden, the cockpit was filled with smoke. Every bell, whistle, and siren was going off, and it was so chaotic and hectic, and he knew they had to bail out. So they opened the door of the plane, and he was the last one to jump out. And he says he can recall floating down uh, and, and collecting his thoughts and thinking, wow, what am I going to do next? And he landed in a wheat field, and, and he had to disengage from his parachute very quickly and hide from the enemy. And fortunately, he was rescued by the Dutch underground at the time. Um, and he was being held in this barn-like facility for a while as he waited things out. And it was there that he noticed something very interesting. He noticed that obviously they were acting very differently than they do when they were, you know, having a good day back at camp or back at home. That made sense. They were in a life or death situation. But what he found very interesting was that everybody was acting a little differently than one another. Some people were like, okay, we need to create a plan before we do anything. Let's take an inventory of everything that we have and then come up with a strategy. And then there were some folks that were like, no, I don't really care about a strategy. I just want to run out of this barn and get out of here right now. And then there were some people that were over off in the corner, very scared and very worried and emotional. And there's Dr. Berkman. And he's kind of observing all of that human behavior. And it's like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And that thought stuck with him because he was fortunately rescued. 
made it back to the United States, and he decided to go back to school. And he got his PhD in industrial psychology. And his dissertation was on stress behavior and what causes stress behavior. And that's how he developed the Berkman method. And that's what separates the Berkman method really from other assessment tools out there is that it identifies how we react under stress and what causes us to feel stressed and behave uh, under stressful conditions. And that's why we really like the Berkman because uh, if you haven't figured out already, Things are not always puppies and rainbows. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say there are going to be times where we're going to have stress in our lives. And we have got to make sure that we are prepared to handle that stress appropriately so that it doesn't hurt our relationships. It doesn't hurt our goals and objectives. And it allows us to continue to remain positive and effective in the things that we want to do. And so that's why we use the Berkman. Now, the Berkman is... I'm sure, as you notice, roughly 300 questions, and I'm sure you were like, wow, this is a long assessment. But the beauty of all of that is that it takes all of those responses and the data that's generated from those responses and converts them into very easy to understandable um, topics. And those topics are Berkman colors, symbols, and the Berkman map. And this is going to allow us to understand human behavior from a very high level, but also get nuanced as we get down and understand your results as we go. So the first thing we'll talk about are the Berkman colors. As you can see, there are four colors, red, green, yellow, and blue. Each one of these colors represents a code word and a question associated with that particular style. Now, the first one is red. Red is the doer style. It's action oriented, always asking the question of what are we going to do? It might go something like this. OK, we need to move this desk from this part of the room to this part of the room. OK, who's going to help me? You, you and you. Let's pick up the desk. Boom. What's next? Very action oriented type style. Next is the green style. Green is code for communication, relationships, and is always asking the question of who. And it might go something like this. OK, we need to move this desk from over here to over here. Well, my friend, let me tell you, I bet you could help me move this desk better than anyone else around. I'm not kidding. I've seen your skills. I know you can help me better than anyone else. So how about we pick this desk up, we move it over there, we high five when we're done, and we're going to feel so great about it. That green style is all about creating relationships, all about communication. Next is the yellow style. Yellow is code for process. It's the analyzer type style, asking the question of how. How are we going to go about doing something? Might go something like this. Okay, X desk needs to go from point A to point B. Okay, well, who's going to pick up which end of the desk? Is one de end of the desk heavier than the other? Do we need to move anything out of the way before we begin? Hold on, let's create a list so we don't forget anything. Ah, that feels nice. That's the yellow style, very process oriented. And last but not least is the blue style. Blue is code for thought. It's a thinker type style and ask the question of what? Or I'm sorry, actually ask the question of why? Why? Might go something like this. Well, that desk needs to go from here to over here. Well, why? I mean, can we put it over here instead? Or maybe we could put a blanket over it if it's an eyesore. Well, how about this? We'll lift up the room, we'll slide it underneath it. That feels nice. We don't have to really move the desk. We can move everything around the room instead around the desk. Asking the question of why. Why are we doing this? Is there a better way? Now, the Berkman recognizes that there are four dimensions of our personality. Two of them are motivators and two of them are behaviors. The first two are our interests and our needs. Those motivators uh, represent, are represented by the asterisk and the circle. And then our two behaviors are our good day usual behavior and also our bad day stress behavior. So let's talk about what these symbols represent a little bit deeper. First, the asterisk, which represents our interests. Now our interests are our top level of motivation. It's our passions, our desires the things we like to do. If time was no issue, if money was no option, these are the activities we would find ourselves doing because they make us happy, they make our hearts sing. 
but it's not a scale of our capabilities. When we talk about interests here in a moment, we are strictly talking about how much we like to do certain things versus others. So it doesn't mean we can't do anything, just means we like to do certain things more than others. So that's our interests. The next symbol is the diamond which represents our usual behavior. Now our usual behavior is a good day behavior, our socialized behavior. It is seen as positive by self and by other people. It's how we come across and how we believe we're most effective to, with other people in the world that we live in. You know, the interesting thing is that it's flexible. You know, on a good day, we can adjust our behavior based on the people we're working with. You know, we're different at home than we are at work and when we're out with our friends. You know, we adjust our style uh, to the environment that we're in on a good day because, and this is important, we're in control of our behavior on a good day. We are in control of how we want to come across to other people and we can adjust our styles accordingly. But what dictates whether or not we're in control? Well, that's the third dimension of our personality and that is represented by the circle which is our needs. Now our needs are our most important aspect of our personality. It's our perceptual filter. It's how we see the world and how we expect the world to treat us. Think of it like this. We all have this little tiny lens that sits in front of our eyes that's made up of all of our experiences, our history, our preferences and biases, but it's also made up of just our wiring, just who we are. And that lens is how we see the world and how we expect the world to treat us. And that's developed throughout our, our young lives. If you if you uh, have ever been around young children, you'll know at a young age, they're just part sponge, part pear. They just absorb information and repeat information. But as they get a little bit older, they start really developing some biases and, and expectations around how they would like to be treated. And that continues to develop throughout their teenage years. But what we have learned through longitudinal studies is that once an, an individual becomes independent uh, of parental control, uh, no longer taking the laundry home to mom and dad, or no longer dependent on them for monies, and you've had some success and some failure in your lives, well, what we've learned is that a person's needs lock into place and they're likely going to stay there for the rest of their lives. And so what's so important about is that college students today, they're at such a formative place in their lives where their needs are really starting to solidify. And that's likely going to be the same way they, they see the world is going to be the same way they see it for the rest of their lives. And that's really important because when, when our needs are not being met, we can be the person we want to be. Everything's great. We can adjust to our environment and we can be, uh, we have a sense of fulfillment. But when our needs are not being met, when the world is not treating us the way we want to be treated, and we suffer those feelings of frustration, anxiety, of anger, and we want to withdraw, and we want to yell, or we want to be passive aggressive, or whatever it might look like in that particular situation, that's when we might flip into the fourth dimension represented by the square, and that is our stress behavior, which is also known as our reactive or, or bad day behavior. Now, stress is normal. It's natural. We all have stress in our lives. But stress is that behavior of how we react when our needs are not being met. And again, it's seen as negative by others and by self, uh, but it's very normal. It's very natural. And it allows us to, it's, it's what happens when we no longer have control over our behavior and our emotions take over and they guide that behavior. And so we talk about stress behavior because again, under stress, we know that we're gonna do things that may or may not be very productive, but we wanna make sure that we have a better hold on what's causing that stress so that we can manage it better in those times of, of frustration. So let's talk about it from the perspective of the Berkman map. So we're gonna utilize this map a lot at, throughout the rest of the presentation as a way of mapping out where we fall within the large spectrum of human behavior. Now think of this map as an X and Y axis where the vertical scale is the scale between how extroverted versus introverted a person might be. You might wanna even say direct versus indirect might be another way to say it. And the horizontal scale is how task-oriented someone might be versus how people-oriented a person might be. And 
which when you look at the code words associated with each one of the colors kind of makes sense. You know, blues are very people oriented, but they tend to be more introverted. That's the thinker's style. Greens being very people focused, but very direct and extroverted. That's where the communication comes from. Where reds, very task focused and wanna get things done, but also direct and straightforward. That's that doer type style. And last, the task focus, but also being more introverted as being yellow, that's where the analyzer style comes from. Now you'll notice if you have your Berkman results in front of you that your symbols will lie within this Berkman map. And that tells us where you fall within the spectrum of all of that data that was generated by this, the assessment. Roughly 300,000 different personality characteristics and traits are identified through the Berkman method, which is really, really, uh, interesting. Um, now, we're talking about human behavior, so that's one of the most complex things that exists, but 300,000, that's going to give us a pretty good idea of where we might fall. Um, now, if you notice, your symbol falls within this map, and if your symbol is up in one of the far corners, as you can see up here in the far red corner, what that indicates is that the characteristics associated with that style might be a little bit more we'll say true or accurate, or maybe even a little bit more intense, where if you have a symbol that's maybe right on the line of another color, well, what's great about that is that while your primary style will be that color that it sits in, you might have some undertones of that other color going on. So you'll wanna hear when we talk about that other color, because you might say, yep, I got a little bit of that going on as well, which is great. And maybe you might have a symbol that's right there in the middle, right, smack dab. And that's great too. That just means you've got a lot of different personality characteristics going on and it's all great. Now, before we go any further, I need to provide a little bit of a, um, what we'll say, what I heard from one participant at one time say, I needed a little bit of warning. And I say that because what we're about to talk about is your personality characteristics as they are associated with the Berkman assessment. However, the Berkman is not perfect, and I am not going to pretend to know who you are just because an assessment says it. At any point in time, if you disagree with the results of the assessment, that's great. Think about what is more accurate. Think about what could be said better. But I think most of you will find that the assessment is fairly accurate as we go through it. But at any point in time, feel free to, uh, to talk about it further. And feel free to post chats or questions in the chat that we can answer later on. Now, the other last thing I'll mention is that the Berkman is non-judgmental. And so as we go throughout this presentation, at no point am I going to say, oh, you've got to be like this to be a good leader, or you've got to be like that to be a good manager. No, this report and this assessment is completely objective. And so it is all good. Everything we talk about is good because it's you and it's unique. So let's dive right in. The first topic that we're going to talk about are our interests. Now, again, these are our passions, our desires, the things we like to do. And so before we go any further, I want you to stop and think for a second. What are some of your favorite hobbies? Take a moment, think to yourself, what do you, what are some of your favorite hobbies? Maybe some things come to mind like, reading a book, or going fishing, or playing outdoor sports, or watching movie with families and friends. All of those things are wonderful hobbies that you might have, but they all are indicated by maybe some of the hobbies that we share as it relates to our interests. So let's talk about what they might look like for each one of the different color styles. If you have a blue interest, meaning if your asterisk on your Berkman results falls within the blue quadrant. But what that signifies is that most uh, folks that have a blue asterisk say, well, we really are interested in creative and innovative ideas. We really love thinking outside of the box, coming up with original concepts, often with a very strategic focus. What we find is that often blue interests really like artistic or really artist types, whether that be writers, musicians, artists, uh, research and development engineers, people who really like to create uh, and, and be original. 
And what we find with blue interest is that folks with blue asterisks really like to look into the future to affect the present. They really want to take a, a look 10 steps ahead to affect the here and now. So that's blue interest. The next is green. Green interest is all about motivating, influencing, and bringing people from point A to point B, often in a very um, persuasive, but also a uh, self-service type style or a service type style where they want to benefit that other person. They want to help that other person. What we find with green interests is that they tend to be sales and marketing types, people who really like to persuade. Uh, also courtroom attorneys, actors, politicians, coaches, teachers, people who like to influence and inspire. And what's interesting about green is that they tend to focus on the present for the present. They like the here and now for the here and now. Next is the red interest. Reds are very interested in the areas of getting things done. They love to build, organize, work towards a finished product, solve tangible problems with tangible solutions, and even make their relationships in their lives very concrete and tangible. What we find with red interests is they tend to be very um, hands-on, construction, engineers, outdoorsmen, athletes, people who really like to be outside as well. And like green, they tend to focus on the present for the present. And yellow interest is really great because what they are interested in is structure, precedent and routine. They love creating and establishing plans and even creating a code for everything that they have in their lives. You know, yellows often say, everything's got its place. Every place has its things. So don't mess with my stuff. Right, yellows? What we find is that yellow, they, <laughs> what we find is that yellows tend to be um, people who really like numbers as well. Um, so CFOs, administrators, historians, librarians, people who really like a process. And, and what's interesting about yellow is that they tend to look at the past to affect the present. They love to look at things in history and take those and apply them to the here and now. So those are some of the unique dynamics as it relates to our interests. Next is usual behavior. Now, again, our usual behaviors, our good day behavior, our good day self, how we want to come across to other people, what we would consider our strengths. And so think about that for a moment. What do you believe are some of your best personality strengths? If you had to describe yourself in an interview or if you were to ask your friends and say, huh, what, what would they say about me from a behavior standpoint? What are some of the things you believe they might say about you? Maybe they would say, she's so outgoing. Or maybe they would say, oh, he's such a good listener. Or maybe they would say, they're the life of the party. All those great things could be aspects of your usual good day self. And remember, it's when you're in control is when you're in good day behavior. Now let's talk about what they look like for each one of the color quadrants. For blue, on a good day, blues tend to be very insightful, selectively sociable, thoughtful, reflective, and optimistic. Hmm. The blues are thinking right now, selectively sociable. What does that mean? Because I think I like it. Well, what I'm talking about is that blues on a good day, we can be the life of the party if we want to be, but we also like hanging back, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, maybe doing a little people watching. Yeah, that feels good. I like that, right? Allowing us to be social if we want to be. Okay. Greens. Greens on a good day. Greens are competitive. They're assertive. They're flexible and they're wildly enthusiastic about new things. They love new things. Oh my gosh. I just saw this new video. I got to share it with all of my friends right now. Best song ever. I got to share it with my friends right now. Okay. On a good day, they tend to be very emotionally expressive uh, and enthusiastic. That's green on a good day. Reds on a good day are very friendly, decisive, frank, energetic, logical, casual, period. Pretty straightforward to the point. That's red style. And last but not least is yellow. Yellows on a good day tend to be very orderly, concentrative, cautious, and insistent, which is all good. 
So those are the usual behavior traits that we tend to see. And again, they can be flexible depending on the style that we have uh, or the environment that we're in. But on a good day, this is typically how we like to come across to others. Now, again, as a reminder, if your symbol is maybe on the line of two colors, you might have said, oh, well, yeah, primarily that one, but I definitely got some undertones of that going on. And you know what? I got a little bit of that green too. That's all great. Okay. So don't think that just because you're in one quadrant, you're, you're bound by that quadrant. By all means, feel free to jump throughout, but that is typically what the personality styles look like for usual behavior. Now, now we're going to get into some deep stuff. Now we're going to be talking about our needs. Now, again, our needs are our deepest level of motivation, our perceptual filter, how we see the world and how we expect the world to treat us. That's very important, very important. So take a moment and I want, to, want you to think about this question. How do you want to be treated with respect? How can someone treat you with respect? Okay, just taking a moment to look at the chat. Very good, I love that some questions are coming in. Now let's talk about needs. Now, as I go through the explanation of needs, what I would like to do is put up the Berkman terminology that they provide for each one of the color quadrants. But I've got a lot of experience in working with different personality styles, whether that be in executive coaching or team building or hiring and selection. And what we see sometimes is maybe a little bit more uh, emotion and application when it comes to these needs. So I'll talk about typically what we hear from the participants themselves as they talk about what their needs are and what they need from the world uh, to be effective and successful and fulfilled. So let's start with blue. So as you can see here, Here's what Berkman talks about as it relates to blue needs. But when I talk to somebody with a blue need, here's what I often hear. I say, blue, what do you need? And how do you see the world? And they respond with, well, you know, the world that I live in, there's black, there's white, and there's a million shades of gray in between. And I love it. I love this complex, nuanced world that I live in. And the best part is I can find that shade of gray that I've never seen before and say, whoa, that is a really cool shade of gray. I've never seen that shade of gray before. This is fascinating. I had no idea that shade of gray existed, but I'm so glad that I found it and I have to share it with my friends. Didn't you see the shade of gray? I just found it. I think it's great. Let's talk about it until we're content and then we'll put it back and then we'll know it's there because if we ever want to talk about it again, we know just the where it is. For blues, it tends to be all about the joy of discovery, the joy of exploration, finding new things and sharing it with the people that we care about. And in doing so, Here's where we'll jump back to the Berkman terminology. In doing so, we need individual reassurance. If we go to somebody and say, look at this great shade of gray that I found, and they say, oh, it's okay. Huh. That blue will say, well, I will go show my shade of gray to somebody who appreciates it. Thank you very much. And that's what, that's what we need is that individual reassurance. We need suggestive direction. We like being asked, not being told. If you ask us in a nice way, we'll go to the ends of the earth for you, but we have to be asked rather than told. We need stimulating activities and we really like personalized scheduling, which means that we like to create our own timelines rather than timelines being imposed on us. So that's an important aspect of blue needs that when fulfilled, they can be their best selves. Now the next style is green. Green is all about saying, you know, the world that I live in is the game of life. Yes, it is. And I love playing this game. You know, for me, there's a game, there's an objective. I get there first, I win the game. It's as simple as that. However, the greens say, there's a couple of things that I need before I decide to play this game. First, I need to know what the rules are. I need to know what the parameters are so I don't go outside the lines and get disqualified or hurt my team. 
But Green also says, I need to know what the rewards are. I need to know if the juice is worth the squeeze, as they say. And if it is, then just something everybody needs to know about me is Green. I am a very unique player. I've got skills you may never seen before. I can jump higher, run faster, swim farther, hit harder than anyone else around. And so all that I need from the world is a little bit of latitude. I don't need to be micromanaged. I don't need you to tell me how to play this game. I'll play the game and I'll help win it for the team and we can collect a reward at the end. But for greens, it's all about the joy of competition. It's that thrill of victory and that agony of defeat. And in doing so, we need individual approval. We love to find authority. We like to know who's in charge and go, who we can go to to get something done. We like a very active environment and we like broad scheduling. We like more of an outline rather than a detailed plan. We'll figure it out as we go, greens typically say. Okay, so that's the green style. The next is red. Red is is really all about saying the reds that I work with, I love it because they say, you know what, the world, the world ain't that complicated. You got black, you got white, you got a few shades of gray in the middle. So whew, let's move forward. For reds, they got this internal generator inside of them that's always going 24-7, 365. And the more that they do, the more energy that they have. And so all that they need from the world is a clear path to lay that energy down. They don't need emotional stuff, ambiguity, obstacles getting in their way. They need that clear path, lay their energy down, get it done. Boom, it's as simple as that. For Reds, it's all about the joy of accomplishment, the joy of getting things done. So in doing so, they need from the world very casual, matter-of-fact relationships. They like strong, direct authority. Tell me what you do. I'll get it done, says Red. They like a very energetic environment, and they like directive scheduling. Okay, very good. Now, on to yellow. I love yellow needs. Yellow needs typically say to me, well, those are interesting perspectives, but mine looks something like this. The world, the way as I see it, is chaotic, disorganized, and at times even a little bit dangerous. However, the environment that I've created for the people I care about, my friends, my family, my brothers, my sister, my coworkers, is safe and secure, clean and pristine. And all that I need from the world is a little bit of control to make sure it stays safe and secure, clean and pristine for the people I care about. For yellows, it tends to be all about the joy of taking care of one's family, all about taking care of others. And in doing so, they need friendly but casual relationships. They need specific direction and control. They like very demanding activities and they like close scheduling. They, know, they like to know when there's a start and when there's an end. And so that's the yellow style, all about that process, all about the joy of taking care of others. So those were our needs. That's our needs dimension, all right? Now, what happens when our needs are not met? Well, it's very simple. Needs met, good day. Needs not met, bad day. That's how it works. When our needs are met, we can have our great days. When our needs are not being met, we're gonna suffer stress. Now, when we talk about stress, think of it from a, think about it on a spectrum. You know, we're not always going to be having the worst day ever, right? Stress is on that spectrum where, you know, oh man, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I didn't have enough time to uh, get to class. And then when I got to lunch, they didn't have my favorite sandwich. And then a paper that I was writing got deleted and I can't find it. And then this happened and then this happened. And then the minorest, littlest thing happens. And that's just the hair that breaks the camel's back. And we're immediately, we lose control. And then there's some instances where we get rocked with something that came out of nowhere and we immediately go into the deep end of the pool when it comes to stress behavior. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is what does that bad negative behavior look like? Because there are some stress that's not bad. You know, butterflies in your stomach before the big game, that's good stress. I'm talking about the stress that hurts 
uh, our relationships and our goals and objectives and is not productive. So as we jump into this, let's think about maybe a time where we've suffered stress behavior and we've looked back and we've said, ooh, shouldn't have done that. Ooh, man, uh, if I could go back, I wouldn't have said that. Let's think about where that's coming from. Now, we all react differently, but here's how maybe we potentially might behave in a stressful situation. Let's talk about blue first. Blue says on a stressful day, and I'll describe this similar to how I did with needs, where blue will describe a situation where they say, you know, I, when I've seen 90 out of 100 different possibilities, but I'm expected to make a decision right now when I know the best decisions in that last 10, just give me a little bit more time. Okay, you know what? You know what? Fine, fine. I will back up. I will close my mouth and I will not say another word, not from me, but you still expect me to make a decision. And I just can't. Things are way too nuanced and varied and everything is looping around in my head and I'm overthinking this and I'm overthinking and I can't make a decision and I'm procrastinating. And now I'm, and now I'm starting to worry and I'm getting my emotions involved. And all I want to do is take a nap and go to sleep and, oh, somebody call a doctor because I've come down with a blue funk, right, blues? When we're in stressful situations, we have this tendency to overthink a situation. We become very uh, almost paralysis by analysis. And it's very difficult to take action when all we can do is overthink the situation. Now, what tends to happen under stress is that we all of a sudden ignore social convention. We might do things that are really outside of the box that might not make a lot of sense, but we just got to do something uh, because I can't make sense of what I have in front of me. Sometimes we become very indecisive because it's, we become fearful uh, of making a decision that we might regret later on. We find it hard to act. And normally on a good day, we're very optimistic, but on a bad day, it's worst case scenario. The worst possibilities always seem to rise to the top and we get very, very nervous about that. So that's blue stress behavior. For greens, green stress behavior may look something like this. You know, when the rules changed in the middle of the game and I did not get the reward I so justly deserve, I'm going to say, you know what? You folks aren't taking very good care of me. So guess what? I'm going to start taking care of myself. Yep, that's right. As a matter of fact, I'm taking over this ship. Yeah, that's what I said. And as a matter of fact, I'm taking over this ship right now. And guess what? It doesn't matter if I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to do it anyway. So watch out. Oh, okay. Pump the brakes a little. We might become a little what we call the, the green monster, little Hulk mode coming on, what that looks like. Sometimes we might become a little domineering. Uh, we might want to um, X any sort of plan that was in place and the only plan we're following is this plan right here that I have. Um, and when I talk to Greens, they often say that they develop a sense of distrust with their other team members because they don't understand why they're not playing the game that they all agree to. You know, they say, what is your motive? Why are we not playing this the way we discussed? And so they develop that, that sense of distrust. Uh, but really what it comes down to is, is a feeling of if I can't get what I think I, the reward that I want, am working for as a team and, and, and as an individual, I'm going to either take control and to a point, I will then say, you know what, fine, I can't play this game and you're not going to play the game. I'm asking you how to play it. I'll take my ball and go play somewhere else. So that tends to uh, be the feeling that greens have on a stressful situation. Now, Let's talk about red for a moment. Red's like, okay, here it comes. Red, red stress behavior may look something like this. When the road is filled with emotional stuff and ambiguity and obstacles, and all I want to do is get things done, and it hurts my motor to go so slow, red's going to say, watch out. My head's going to go down. My blinders are going to go up. I'm going to focus on the task that I deem appropriate, and I shall rush towards it, grab it by the throat. I'm going to work on it, work on it, work on it, work on it. And when I'm done, I'm going to feel so proud of myself. But I look around, and there's some collateral damage. I may have said something, or I may have uh, not listened to somebody's opinions, or I may have disregarded someone's 
feelings a little bit because I was focused on the task. I had to get it done, but we may have done it in a way that uh, was a little too abrasive and, and did it in a way that others felt was dismissive. And so sometimes it, it looks like being impatient or being busy for the sake of being busy. Um, and it's hard to give individual support under stress because, again, we're focused on the task rather than the people around us. And we call that the red ball because um, we just want to charge forward, find the path of least resistance and get it done. OK. Yellow. Yellow stress behavior may look something like this. When... The world that I've created, I no longer feel like I have any sort of control over. And the safety and security of the people I care about is in jeopardy. What Yellow tends to say is I develop a bunker mentality. I'm going to cover up everything that I think is still good. And guess what? Nobody's touching this stuff. Good, bad, necessary, unnecessary. Nobody's touching this stuff. And I might have a tendency to develop a passive aggressive stance. Well, why am I doing this? Well, you ought to know, so I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> right? We get in this sense of, we expect the world to give us the information we need to keep things safe. And when they don't, we become very hunkered down and taken in by the situation. Now, here's the interesting thing. On a good day, yellows are so good as standing on top of a hill. And their mind is like an Excel spreadsheet where they're just able to absorb information, plug it into boxes and create a pattern, a mosaic, if you will, of the big picture. But on a bad day, they're no longer standing on that hill. They're knee deep in the trenches and in the weeds and they get taken in by the situation. Okay, so that's stress behavior. Take a deep breath for a second. I know that may have been heavy, like, woo, man, I just saw that happen. Uh, I was just home for, for Thanksgiving, stress behaviors came out. I'm focusing on finals, stress behaviors coming out. Something happened in one of my relationships that I didn't like, now I'm stressed out. Maybe you've seen this recently, or maybe you haven't seen this at all, but somewhere down the road, you might be put in a situation where you're like, wow, that guy said it might happen to me, and there it came, that little, that little monster came out. Um, normal, natural, again, we all have it. So let's talk about how we can control that a little bit more when we find ourselves going down that path. Now think of it like this. We're all traveling down this road, the road of life. And along this road are these potholes where there's this little stress devil saying, come on down. It feels good. Get mad, get angry, get frustrated. And in the moment, we feel very justified in how we react, don't we? We say, yep, you know what? The world has done this to me, so I'm going to give it back to the world. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get mad. I'm going to close my door and withdraw from the world, whatever it might be. And when we're down in that pit with that little stress devil, it feels natural. And it even feels good for a little while until we get to the point where we realize that we're not being effective. It's not helping the situation at all. And we have to climb out of that hole. So how do we do so? Well, there's some things that some easy things we can do when we find ourselves going down into that pit. For blues, first of all, create a timeline that will allow us to get out of our heads and start moving towards action one step at a time. Stay on task, work towards a decision, and summon your energy. Don't say, oh man, all I want to do is go to sleep and not think anymore, so I'm going to take a nap, and then when I wake up, everything will be better, because that typically doesn't happen, right? Summon your energy and make that decision to move forward. For greens, Take a step back when we're in that green Hulk mode, we want to be a little domineering and we're feeling that distrust. Take a step back and listen and try to understand others. Okay, tell me why you're playing the game the way you're playing it and I will consider it. Okay, that's actually not a bad idea. I will, I will now abide by that. Now I know we're on the same team, okay? Get that information, compete with goals, not individuals. Think team think we, not just me and I. For reds, when we've got that generator going and we want to get things done and it hurts to go so slow and we just want to be that bull in a china shop, we've got to rechannel that energy effectively. So whether that be 
uh, going for a walk or listening to music or talking to somebody that we trust, rechannel that energy. Stop and think for a minute. For Reds, oftentimes we just need to take five seconds to consider other people's perspectives, consider their thoughts and ideas so we, that we don't unintentionally come across as abrasive. And lastly, for yellows, when we get sucked into the situation, we're in that very rigid um, stance where we don't want to take any sort of risk. Well, we need to take a step back and do what we do best and think big picture. Be receptive of new information and be proactive about asking for information and be excited about new solutions rather than saying, oh, that's probably going to be a terrible idea we have to convince ourselves that, okay, that might actually be a good idea. The more information I have, the better. So those are some tips and tactics that you can take to get out of that stress behavior. Now, no matter where you are on the Berkman map, it's all good. So maybe you, like I said before, have a symbol up in one of the far corners, and maybe you've got a symbol right there on the line of another. Well, what's interesting is the further apart those symbols are, the more dynamics you'll have within your personality, the differences you'll have within your personality. In this scenario, you've got a green interest, you, do, you like green things, but maybe you do them in a yellow way, but you need people to treat you like a blue. That's great, but it's important that you communicate that to others. Then some of you may have all of your symbols in the same color quadrant. That's really great too, because people are going to be able to say, oh, they like green things. They want to be treated like a green and I can expect them to act like a green. That's great. Only downside is it might be a little bit difficult to understand some of the other perspectives. And the benefit of having a symbol maybe in three different quadrants is that you'll have a broader range of human behavior, but at times it might be a little bit more difficult for people to read you. But again, wherever you fall, keep this in mind. It's all good because it's all you. Now, we're at the point at the end of the presentation, and I want to leave you with this moment of Zen. Here's what's really interesting. I learned early on as we talk, as I learned more about self-awareness, that our motivations are invisible to other people. So think about that. Your interests and your needs your passions, and how you want to be treated are invisible to other people. The only way they know how to treat you is based on your behavior, your good day behavior, and your bad day behavior. So I want you to consider, is your good day style, how you come across to people, the same as you want them to treat you back? For some people, it might not be. And that's why communication is so important. When you can communicate to somebody else, here's how you can get the best out of me. How can I get the best out of you? What can I give you that is going to make you your best self? Well, that's when true collaboration happens. When both sides work to meet each other in the middle and see the world from each other's lens. That's when we will have most effectiveness. And that's where leadership comes into play. So I want to thank you for going through your Berkman assessment with me. I can see that we've had some great questions come into the chat, so I'll take uh, some time to answer those. And, and Jason, feel free to help me out here. I haven't been able to keep up with all of them, but um, let's take a look at some of the, the questions that have come in. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I was actually communicating with Thomas that this is a great refresher. So thank you so much. I, it just has been good. Um, thank you. Uh, looks like we we have, we were actually just having a, uh, just conversation back and forth between the participants here. So um, looks like we have at least a couple of questions. Uh, Terry asks, uh, I'm curious, how can you tell the difference a little more between a yellow and a blue, like in their natural state on a good day? Very good question. Thank you, Terry. So what we tend to see uh, is they're both going to be a little bit more introverted and indirect on a good day. The main difference is you're going to see blues wanting to be way more creative um, and outside of the box where you're going to typically see yellows more gravitating more towards the rules, standard operating procedure, how things that are consistent and routine where blues tend to be acting 
like to act in a very original type way where they never want to do the same thing twice in many respects, I find. And so that'll be the difference. While they'll come across more indirect and subject uh, and even subjective at well, I say subjective is really going to come more from blue, where objective is going to come more from yellow. Good question. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, there was another question that was posed by me um, on uh, blue stress specifically. So you, you were talking about some of the stressors and things that happen. So as a blue stress person, when there's a lot of things coming at you, is this when uh, you can put a, potentially become uh, basically like paralyzed to move forward, like you just feel like you can't move, you're stuck in quicksand type of thing. Absolutely. Um, you know, paralysis by analysis is, is a real uh, feeling for blues, just the overwhelming weight of there's so much going on, there's so much that I have uh, either allowed to be piled on me or um, has has come across me that I, I'm at the point of no return and I don't see a way out. Uh, and I love the example of quicksand, Jason, because oftentimes Blue will say, I don't feel as if I can dig myself out of it. How do I do that? And the best method to pull ourselves out of that quicksand is to try to stop thinking, write down your thoughts on a piece of paper, allow yourself to see it and then be very proactive about prioritizing what goes to the top of the list and then how can I start crossing things off and what we normally what we typically see is once blue start acting and taking uh, steps forward well then everything kind of comes into clarity but here's another uh, stress behavior that blues also tend to do and, and I do this as well where I think I'm drowning and then I say, you know what? I'm going to drink some more water. Why not? And what I mean by that is we do things that might be action oriented, but they're not productive. They don't do things that accomplish the things that are weighing us down. And so we have to make sure that if we are taking action, action feels good. And I remember when I was in college, I would have a big paper due the next day and I'd be stressing about it. I got to get this paper done. And then I would just say, you know what? It's time to clean my room. And I would start cleaning my room instead of doing the paper because it was action oriented. It felt good, but it wasn't productive. It didn't meet the objective that I needed to work on. So that is some of the, uh, the tendencies of blue stress that and how we can get out of it is create that timeline and create a plan and start crossing things off the list. Minor things. But as soon as we start taking baby steps forward, we'll start being able to, to walk and then run forward. Awesome. Awesome response. Thank you so much. Looks like we have time for one more question. And it looks like we have one more question from Thomas. Uh, he asks, do our interests, usual behaviors, needs, stress behaviors, and colors change over time? Uh, example, like uh, based in the current environment we're in. Oh, Thomas, great question. Um, Here's what we tend to see over the course of someone's life. It is quite possible that someone's interests might change. You know, they're um, one year they're they're really interested in gardening, and ten years later they've really gotten into um, music or something like that. So their interests might fluctuate a little bit, just depending on what what they found new passions in. With usual behavior that fluctuates a little bit as well. Sometimes our usual behavior can change based on the environment that we're in or the job that we might have. If we're in a job that requires us to be very action oriented, well, we might be a little bit more red depending on when we took the assessment versus if we're in a job that is very um, educational or maybe we're a teacher or something like that, a manager type role, then we might be more into the green style. Um, so that might fluctuate based on the the environment that we find ourselves in most. But what's interesting is that we find that our needs and stress, that typically stays consistent for the majority of our lives. Again, once we get uh, in our early 20s and that needs really starts to lock into place, it's likely going to stay there forever. Now, there is a caveat to that, Thomas. There are instances where a traumatic event could happen in someone's life to change their perspective. You know, things like they were in the military and saw a battle or, 
they uh, were diagnosed with a life-threatening illness or they lost a spouse or a child, you know, something that just totally rocks a person to their core um, and, and it changes the way they see the world. And you, you, maybe you've heard that before, somebody who's gone through an experience and they say, wow, I just see the world so differently now. That's, that's uh, an indication that their needs and their perspective have changed. Uh, but for the vast majority of us, 95% of us, it's gonna stay pretty consistent um, throughout the rest of our lives. Now I'll go a little bit deeper with this and say that there have been instances where someone has taken the Berkman assessment at a time in their life when they weren't, didn't have a lot of stress. And then they took the assessment again at a point in their life where there was a lot of stress. Maybe they had a job they weren't satisfied with, or maybe again, they were sick. Maybe they had cancer or something like that. And their assessment changed. But then they took the assessment again after they had come out of that traumatic experience and their assessment reverted back to what the way it was the first time. And so there is instances where a, a stressful situation similar to what we might be in now, a global pandemic, may affect our, our state of mind right now and our perspective right now. But hopefully, and I know we're all hopeful that this isn't going to last for too much longer and we'll be able to revert back to ourselves, our most productive selves and how we behaved and how we saw the world prior to this happening. So really good question. Um, those are some of the things that I've seen throughout our experience. Yeah, great questions, everyone. Thank you. Well, I think that's all the time we had for tonight. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and then thank you to Chris for all of the great information and great refresher here uh, for those who have uh, heard you speak before. So thank you. Uh, and then as I close out, I just wanna remind everyone to log into the My AKSI community to go and uh, join the My Group section. Uh, perhaps you can post about the event and what you learned or something along those lines, garner some conversation there um, as well as uh, you can check out the My Learning, the events, the volunteer, central piece, uh, my AKSI uh, community is the home and hub of it all. So thank you everyone again and uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks everyone.